This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We are hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. So there you go. You're not so rusty after all. Well, I messed it up once. <laughs> we were just laughing before we started this saying we haven't recorded in four weeks. And we're both so rusty at the whole technology and getting everything ready to go. But you pulled it off. I couldn't find the record button on my camera either. <laughs> Ah, wow. Back in the new year. Happy new year. Yeah. So skiing is something that happened in both our households over Christmas. So I got James a set of skis for Christmas and we got out three times. In fact, we got out this past weekend and it was just fantastic. I didn't go. It's not so easy for me to just go and rent boots because <laughs> people don't rent size uh, 17 boots. Um, but my wife took uh, three of the kids for they all had lessons, including including my wife, which was pretty cool. So they had four four days of lessons, and then they loved it. Kids loved it. That's great. So you, you got equipment or you rented equipment for them? Rented. Just but, to make sure they like it? Yeah. I, I think maybe for next year we'll we'll get it because I think it's it's like a, I don't know, three-minute drive from our house. So there's no yeah. reason for us not to have that as a primary activity in the winter. Very cool. It was so great to get back into it. We haven't done it in over a decade, and it's, it was beautiful. Got, got out even night skiing, too, which was so much fun. That's awesome. Two very quick show shout-outs for you. Um, if anyone's into the music industry, and I know we mentioned the uh, the show, The Defiant Ones, which talked about uh, music producer Jimmy Iovine, but we discovered two more uh, similar documentaries over the holidays that were both unreal. One was on Clive Davis and the other one, other one was David Geffen. So they're both icons clearly from the you know 70s, 80s, 90s into 2000. How they came to discover their careers and what talent they uncovered and developed is just jaw-dropping. Unbelievable stories, both of them. Um, Clive Davis, for, uh, for example, is responsible for discovering Aretha Franklin, The Grateful mm -hmm. Dead, Bruce Springsteen, Jeez. and even up to Maroon 5, like current day uh, bands. Wow. Um, one of the coolest parts of the story I found was with Whitney Houston. So he discovered Whitney. And when they were doing the um, movie, The Bodyguard, he pushed back and said, you're not focusing enough on her music. The movie should be about her music. And they actually went back and rebuilt the movie based on his feedback. And this is what caused, you know, Whitney Houston to be such a huge star with the hit, I Will Always Love You, which I didn't know is actually written by Dolly Parton. Hmm. It's pretty cool. And yeah. David Geffen, he co-created Asylum Records, and then later in his career created, and I've forgotten this, DreamWorks Studio, movie studio with Steven Spielberg and Jeffrey Katzenberg. So Geffen was in music, as well as Broadway, as well as movies. And he, get this, he helped create... Jackson Brown, as well as the Eagles. Like the Eagles were nothing when he found them. He said, go back for two years and make an album. So they went away. Like it seems obvious now the Eagles are huge. They're unbelievable. But back then they were nothing. He helped create them. Wow. Also uh, bands like, you know, Joni Mitchell, Bob Dylan, Aerosmith, Nirvana. He was also very close friends with John Lennon and Yoko Ono. And in fact, he was in New York when John Lennon was shot. And he's the one that had to give the news to Yoko that... Uh, John Lennon did not survive hmm. the shot at, at the at the Dakota. These are shows on, on Netflix or what? They're on Netflix. I believe they're both on Netflix. Phenomenal, both of them, if you're into the music industry. Hmm. Cool. Uh, a couple quick shout-outs that we, we missed in our year-end show that we, uh, in, in hindsight, of course, should have given shout-outs to the community yeah. moderators. I mean, they, they put in a ton of, a ton of work behind the scenes and and not behind the scenes, uh, making contributions to the community. But that's Alex, uh, Dan, uh, Marco, Bento, and uh, Eresk, Eric. Um, so a b big thanks and shout out to all, the, all of our community moderators who again, put in a ton of work, both moderating, but also contributing valuable content. Can't thank them enough. Yeah, that was our mistake, not including them in the year end showing our apologies and, and, and extreme gratitude for the great work you guys are doing. Um, wanted to announce something that I put out on Twitter and on LinkedIn over the holidays. So you remember Katie Milkman last year talked about how New Year's can be a fresh start for people. 
and over the holidays and had the free time to get through four books. So I was writing, writing my Peloton one day. And as you know, I get a lot of these crazy ideas when I'm on my Peloton, I'll, I'll often drop you a, a text message when I'm writing. Anyways, I came up with this idea of just thinking about the books I've read, as well as the number of people that have reached out to me saying, oh, I wish I could read as much as you, which four years ago, as you know, I was not a reader. I've mentioned that before. I hardly read at all. Um, other than, you know, business type reading. So I was thinking on the Peloton, what could I do to maybe encourage people to read more? So I came up with this idea of 22 and 22, just a simple reading challenge. So I put it out there on Twitter and LinkedIn to see if anybody would be interested. Ended up getting almost 250 people saying, yes, I'd be interested in some sort of something. I don't know what that something was going to be. Anyway, so I, I talked to Angelica and she found um, a software tool that gamifies the experience of reading, hmm. which is a super cool idea. So we've signed today to get the software and we're going to, on February 10th, launch the 22 and 22 reading challenge. So this is not a book club. You read what you want to read. It's just a, a, a place for us to um, meet up, to create a community to talk about and to share the books we're all reading with the hope of encouraging people to read their 22 books in 2022. So it's a pretty fun site. Uh, you can share books. There's badges you earn. We can do little sub communities. So we have a lot to learn about that. So um, on February 10th, we will be launching that. Very cool. I think it's going to be very cool. I was quite taken by the uh, by the interest from people, and a lot of people actually DM me on the platforms to say how much they're looking forward to it. So I think we'll get some good book ideas going, which will be fun. Can you, can you say anything about the the special guest that's going to help us launch it? Uh, no, there's going to be a special guest on that day to help us launch it. So it's a pretty big name in, in the in the reading book industry. You're keeping it a surprise a out there. It's going to oh, keep it a surprise. Geez. Let's keep it a surprise. I don't yeah. like surprises. It's, it's a very cool. It's going to be very cool. Yeah. Had some very nice recent reviews. Gao Linneo in Canada says, yay, great financial podcast, clear and accurate. Had a nice feedback from Kenneth S. 1987, who said that the podcast made him rearrange his personal finances, which I thought was pretty nice. And uh, took the simple approach to his portfolio, sold all my stocks and moved my mutual funds into indexes. It has helped me ignore all the mega hype noise that dominates every platform. I now have a plan, not just for my portfolio, but for everything else. An investing plan, a savings plan, a spending plan, and a living plan. I started listening to the podcast in late September from episode one. Yes, a lot of people go back to episode one and just finished 181. I've been reading the guest books. and They've also proven very helpful and informative. They recommended this to anybody. We also got a nice email from Mike in the States last week who said that he stumbled across the podcast Community to Work one day and it was such a huge breath of fresh air to hear the peer review fact-driven approach that you have on finance as a whole, let alone the ability to look at a situation from two different perspectives and potentially arrive at the same or divergent conclusions while having similar end goal in mind. So he talks about how the podcast had a huge impact on his company and he has two full-time employees and two seasonal employees. And they've had conversations at work, get this, about the market, some of the concepts, renting versus buying, and personal finance has really become more commonplace in his workplace, which is a rarity in his field, to say the least. So his crew is, has used the computer after hours to set up uh, retirement accounts, and they've done research on index funds to get started. So I, I believe that's it. That's pretty cool. I believe it. You become part of a community. I mean, the 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 podcast rational minder community is up to uh by the time this episode come comes out it'll be at six thousand uh <laughs> users in there which is what it's is a lot of people but you get people who are coming in and, and learning and educating themselves and it's a it's if you're in there if you're in that community it's what you chat about it's whatever the <laughs> whole thing is based around that so I, I think what what mike is saying uh is great but that doesn't surprise me you get a bunch of people together with similar interests and that, that they'll talk about their interests just shows the love of community, right? Yeah. And, and hopefully that's what happens with the, the, uh, the reading challenge. Upcoming guest next week, we have Robin Wigglesworth, author of Trillions. Phenomenal interview. 
Wes Gray joins us the week after that to talk about the ETF marketplace. And then Andrew Hallam, who is the author of the upcoming book, Balance, How to Invest and Spend for Happiness, Health and Wealth. His book comes out January 18th. Do you want to talk about your little part of that book? Oh, sure. Well, and Andrew asked me to write a, uh, you know, the cover, cover blurbs. So he sent me a, a, a draft copy, I don't know, it was months ago. And I read it and wrote a little blurb. And my blurb exists on the cover of the book now. It's kind of kind of neat. So you're a cover. I'm on the cover. On the cover. Awesome. <laughs> and then uh, two weeks after that, on February 17th, Ayelet Fishbach will be joining us. And she's the author of the just-released book, Get It Done, Surprising Lessons from the Science of Motivation. Excellent book. I just finished it this morning. I loved it. So she's a colleague of, of um, Katie Milkman. So that's how we got the introduction. So you finished your book. I was thinking, 22 and 22, you must be done your first book by now. And you are. I'm done three. I got three done. Oh, geez. I got four done over the holidays. I got three done this year. You're crazy. I'm, I'm rereading books that I read years ago and hey, very slowly rereading them. It's, I mean, we shut down over Christmas for the first time ever, which gave me lots of time. COVID gave lots of time. Right. And people know I get up early. So I, there's so many other things I just stopped doing, like watching news or TV and stuff. So I just, I just enjoy it so much. As always, connect with us on Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, I'm on Peloton at CP313 and hashtag Rational Reminder. And don't forget the Instagram page for the Rational Reminder podcast. If you checked it out today, you saw my Fender Stratocaster guitar. I didn't check it out today. <laughs> and also, don't forget, in our store, we have Winter Tukes still available. I think there's like 40 or so still available. And there's Talking Sense cards available. It's unbelievable how many people have ordered Talking Sense cards. It's, they're, they're amazing. They really are. It's nuts. It's nuts. We have a whole new batch coming in soon, so there'll be lots of supply. Awesome. And then shortly, we'll also have the 2021 guest mug available. Anything else? No, I think that's good. We can go. We've got, a, I think, a pretty pretty meaty episode today. That um, <laughs> Actually, I, I spent a fair amount of time over the holiday uh, just because I enjoyed it, chipping away at, at a lot of this content. So ho- hopefully, hopefully people like it. See, you're working on the content. I was reading books. Yeah, it's fair. It's no different. Cool. All right, here we go. Welcome to episode 183 of the Rational Reminder podcast. Okay, kick it off with a quick book review. This one was recommended to me by a previous guest, Robin Tobe. So she saw that I posted online how much I enjoyed a Dopamine Nation, which was uh, Dr. Anna Lemke's book and past guest. So um, Robin recommended I check out the book, The Long Game, How to Become a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World, which was written by Dory Clark. Um, I love the book. As as certainly you know, and everyone on our team knows, and certainly my kids know, it's probably the phrase I I say the most, which is you got to play the long game, keep a long-term focus. And, you know, certainly we've built our company um, to play the long game. This is also very much the spirit of the, the Michael Dell book that we reviewed, Play Nice But Win. And, and, you know, once you're clear in your values, you can then set out to build something spectacular over the long term and get away from thinking solely about short-term results. And that's kind of the point of the book hmm. is to help you become a strategic long-term thinker and to get above the day-to-day noise and to start thinking about your life, your business goals, and then set out to create the strategy and the the skills and the tactics necessary to achieve those goals. So the book is full of ideas, full of tactics. Uh, It's extremely well written and I found it quite interesting, but what, maybe I was overthinking this over the holidays, but the book actually caused me to stop and think about all sorts of stuff and also made me contemplate how to value time. And I don't know what it was, and maybe it was me more than the book, but somehow this thinking experience happened for me. So I I started to wonder, so if I spend three hours reading this book, or five hours, whatever it takes, and if it shifts me or the reader a degree or two and cause some sort of crystallization of an idea, I personally view that as time well spent. 
other people might think that's not a good use of time. Um, but some of the ideas that really caused me to think, um, which links to kind of the hundred year plan that we've talked about for a company, but she talked about how a career has four waves. This really stuck with me and I've mentioned it. I know I mentioned it to you mm -hmm. and to others over the past couple of weeks. So the four waves of a career that the author talked about, number one is learning, which is when, you know, early in your career, you finish your studies, you're becoming more knowledgeable about your field. And then it morphs into the creative or creation phase or wave, which is where you take what you know and you start creating value both for your clients and for the enterprise, no matter what kind of, of enterprise you're in. And then the next phase as you get along in your career is connecting, where you connect with others in your field, you learn from them, you contribute back to the community to make it better. Now these waves aren't all mutually exclusive, of course, but they're just general waves. Then the last wave is reaping, which is when you're at the top of your, your field and your game, and it's time to enjoy the benefits, you know, the, the so-called, it took 20 years to become an overnight success. Mm. Another interesting insight from the book was she talked about competition. And the longer the game you're playing, the fewer the, there are competitors mm. competing with you. It's like, that's pretty meaningful. Like you're willing to do the work. And this podcast is a great example. Like this is a lot of work week in, week out, right? So just by that amount of work, you're sifting out a lot of potential competition. And she also talked about how, you know, she gave the example of Daniel Pink, who we, we mentioned before, the, the author and, and thinker. So you may not be Daniel Pink today, but you can be Daniel Pink of 20 years ago before he was Daniel Pink. Mm. So what do you have to do over the next 20 years to become the Daniel Pink in 20 years of who Daniel Pink is today? Hmm. So I thought that was kind of interesting too, just showing you could be anything you want to be. Like yeah. four years ago, we'd never, well, we'd been in front of a microphone at the radio station, but we'd never done a <laughs> podcast before. And I'm not saying this is good. I'm just saying you can, you can recreate yourself. Right. In the end, the three three keys that she summarizes to being a strategic long-term thinker are number one, independence, the heart. You have to be true to yourself. You have to focus on what's important to you and develop your own long-term personal strategy. If you don't enjoy it, you're not going to do the 10,000 hours to become great at it. You have to be curious. Why live the life that someone else may have predetermined for you? doesn't make any sense. Be open to clues that may help set your dire your direction in life. I mean, this has been your message all along. Like you don't have some master plan. You just go where there's an interest for you, right? Yeah. Yep. And then uh, lastly, resilience. Just try stuff, experiment. Who cares if it doesn't work? Who cares if this podcast didn't work? Yep. I Rejection. Love, love trying stuff, throwing stuff. Rejection is just another piece of information. You know, we're, we're totally living proof of that. We've had so many experiences where you happen to trip over some sort of lucky experience that ends up becoming some great vein of opportunity. So you have to be resilient and keep trying until those veins show up in your life. Mm -hmm. They all build on each other too, though. Successes build on each other. For sure. Anyways, highly recommend the book. Very cool. Good insights. So I had a couple notes on, on episode 180 where we talked about the lack of a Canadian housing bubble. Um, I saw some interesting comments online about that episode, um, really met, meeting it with skepticism about how, how you could possibly say that Canada's not in a housing bubble. Um, but just to reiterate, the, the model there is called the user cost model, and it's the model for the economic cost of living in a home. And from that perspective, Canadian home prices are not detached from fundamentals, and they're easily justified without making implausible assumptions for future price appreciation, which is one definition of a bubble. That's the, the Rob R. Not definition of a bubble. Now, I do have to make a correction, though. So uh, I, I had said in that episode that capital appreciation expectations today have to be slightly elevated relative to history to make the current imputed rent, that's the, the rent implied by the user cost model, uh, the ratio of that to actual rent, um, so I, I had said that you had to make slightly elevated capital appreciation assumptions to hold that ratio constant. And it was 0.84% above the 
uh, the 1% baseline expectation, which is what we said is a, is a reasonable base, baseline for capital appreciation. So not a huge, um, not, not an implausible assumption for capital appreciation to justify current prices. Now, I, I'm going to do a white paper on this topic. And so I was just revisiting my data and going through the numbers and, and starting to put the, formalize the ideas a bit more to put on uh, in a paper. And I realized that I had incorrectly referenced a column. So I'd mixed a real and nominal variable in calculating one of the ratios. And so for one of my charts, including the one that, uh, that I got the 0.84% uh, higher price appreciation from, uh, was off. So when I corrected that, I'm laughing because uh, <laughs> people were skeptical that, that you needed a slightly higher, uh, slightly elevated assumption for future growth. Correcting that, uh, it, it actually completely goes away. So interestingly, when I mixed a real, real or nominal, nominal variable uh, to create that ratio, the current, uh, the, the current ratio of imputed to actual rents is almost exactly at its historical average. Wow. Almost exactly. So I, I normalized it to the historical average because it's comparing uh, average rents for two bedrooms, I think, to home prices. And that ratio is not necessarily that meaningful because why would you compare two bedroom rents to, to home prices, um, to, to medium, median home prices? So I normalized it based on the full average. So what ends up happening is the average is just one. Um, and the current ratio is 1.01. .01. So almost exactly on, on the average without having to make that higher assumption for capital appreciation. So it's actually even less bubbly than I had said it was in, uh, in episode 180, which I thought was, uh, was kind of interesting. So as high as prices are, they're exactly where we would expect them to be in equilibrium with rates where they are and with the set of reasonable assumptions that we walked through uh, in, in episode 180 for the risk premium, the property tax, maintenance costs, slash depreciation. So I thought that was interesting. Um, I, I saw one comment online for that episode <laughs> saying that, uh, well, this definition of a bubble could only be called a bubble in hindsight. And I read that and it's like, yes, yes, that is what, <laughs> that, that is what a bubble is in an efficient market. You can only call the bubble in, in hindsight. If, if prices reflect current information, you can only call it a bubble in, uh, in hindsight. So uh, the, the commenter on the internet was saying that this was a negative of the model, but it's actually a, a feature or expectation at least. Well, you can see you caught Oscar's interest. <laughs> see, he perked up here. <laughs> Interested in home prices. Makes yeah. sense. Uh, now, the other, the other thing that I wanted to, the reason that I wanted to bring this up, so I wanted to make that correction and say that houses are even less bubbly uh, than, than I, I had said they were. Uh, but the other thing that I wanted to mention is that th th that doesn't mean that there's not a lot of price risk in Canadian housing. So just because there's no uh, bubble, there, there's no uh, requirement to make implausible uh, assumptions about future price appreciation uh, to, to justify current prices, that doesn't mean there's not a lot of price risk. Um, w one of the other insights that we get from this user cost model is that prices should be very sensitive to changes in rates when rates are already low or when the user cost is low. So I think that's, I'm, I'm not saying everything's going to be fine. Prices are going to stay this high forever. That's not the point of, of, of saying that it's not a bubble. Um, and if, if we look at the historical correlation between home prices and real interest rates, the user cost model would predict a relationship that historical correlation is negative 0 0.81. So there does appear, in fact, to be a relationship. Now, the sensitivity to a 1% change in rates, and this is the important part, is much greater today than it was in the past. So if, if rates rose 1% in the early 90s when the user cost was around 9% to start, uh, a 1% uh, rise in rates, we would expect prices to fall by 11%. Uh, the user cost today is closer to 3%, and a 1% rise in real rates would be expected to drop prices 33%. Wow. Just because of how uh, low rates are to start, or how low the user cost is 
to start. And that's just a very simple mathematical insight that comes from the user cost model. So I, I'm saying prices are justified, but that, that doesn't mean it's safe. And it, it, what it means is you can't predict when it's going to pop, right? Like, the, like that commenter said, um, which is exactly what you'd expect if, if you believe the market's at least somewhat, uh, somewhat efficient. So I'm not saying housing's a safe investment. I'd be pretty nervous buying a house if I had a, you know, five-year time horizon. Um, the, the interest rate risk with home prices right now is, is pretty, pretty scary. Um, so I, I, I want to make sure that was, that was clear. I'm not saying Canadian real estate's not in a bubble. Everything's fine. <laughs> I'm just saying that prices can be rationally justified, but there's still a lot of price risk because of, uh, interest rates. Right. And then I just had a couple more comments on, on housing, just from stuff that I've seen online with people talking about our, our episodes or common sense investing episodes about, about housing. Um, a common confusion. I've said that, that, uh, houses are depreciating assets. And a lot of people on the internet say, well, no, they're not. <laughs> they appreciate. But the important distinction there is that buildings, houses, the, 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 the construction, the structure is a depreciating asset. That's, that's a fact. Um, and whether you call that a maintenance cost or depreciation, it's there. And that's the 1% ish maintenance cost that we always use in modeling this. And a side note on that, I think 1% is way too low. Oh my goodness. I haven't even lived in a house for a year and the amount of <laughs> time that I spend on house, not even the money, not even the money, like <laughs> buying house stuff is expensive, but you know, the trips to Home Depot, the the time, my own time that I have to spend because no, you know, the, a plumber's not going to come for this little thing or a carpenter's not going to come for this little thing. So you got like, you do it yourself. Anyway, I think 1% when you factor in the time cost is way, uh, way too low. Uh, I agree. And especially when you take a look at like large renovations, like it's so easy now to do a $50,000 bathroom or kitchen. You start amortizing that over a number of years. But with those big, the big capital costs for sure, I think, but maybe that gets you to 1%, right? If you, if you amortize the 50,000 over 30 years, whatever. Um, but it's but just you're talking little, the small stuff. Yeah, it's just, just the little stuff. The small stuff. It just chips away. It's like, okay, I've got to spend one day of my weekend doing house stuff. And that's just the thing. It's <laughs> like, you know, I, I knew that going into buying a house, but I'm... It, it just becomes more real when you live it, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, so why, I think 1% is too low of maintenance cost. But uh, to finish up on that, uh, buildings depreciate and find someone that disagrees with me on that. Uh, be curious to hear their opinion. <laughs> but uh, la land depreciates though. And so in aggregate, the building plus the land, you do tend to see, uh, you do tend to see appreciation, especially if you're keeping up with your depreciation costs, your, your maintenance cost. Uh, and then the last comment I want to make on on housing before we move on is that I, I've I've never really had a strong opinion on whether owning or renting is better. My position's always been that renting deserves consideration in that decision. And from a financial perspective, you can be agnostic, or or there are cases where, from a financial perspective, one option can be better than another, and therefore you should make the decision based on other factors like your, your time horizon or where you want to live or, uh, how much control you want to have over the property, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, so my, my intended message has always been that renting deserves a place in that discussion, but not that it's better than owning. It can be better in certain cases, just as owning can be better in certain cases. And I think I've always tried to make that point, but I just want to make sure it was clear. That's all Speaking I got for the housing update. Speaking of bubbles, <laughs> you're quite happy to know that innovation stocks are not in a bubble. In fact, they're in deep value. Yeah. So this one made this one made a lot of noise online. Boy, did it ever. Uh, so Kathy Wood posted on the ARC website uh, the article of the title that you just said, Innovation Stocks Are Not in a Bubble. We believe they are in deep value territory. Interesting. Uh, so she, she laments in the article that, and this is a quote, perhaps influenced by negative headlines in the media and by the inherent volatility of our strategy, some clients have sold near the bottom, the bottoms of market cycles 
turning what otherwise would have been temporary losses into permanent losses. And we know that. We, we discussed in a, in a previous episode that the average investor return in ARC has been not so good, uh, despite the fund having positive returns, because, well, people buy and sell at the wrong time, and that's, that's nothing new. Investors yeah. tend to do that. Uh, so I, something that I did just for some additional context um, was look at Kathy's past funds. So pre-ARC. Pre-ARC, what did Kathy do? And what was her experience? And I, I, it's not intended to be a knock on Kathy, but, you know, Ka- Kathy's talking about um, people bailing on strategies. And uh, it, it sounds like from reading the article, she's got experience with that happening. So I just wondered, I, I, like, has, has she lived this before pre, mm-hmm. pre-ARC? And, and she has. So she managed the Alliance Bernstein Discovery Growth Fund from 2003 to early November 2009. And using return attribution, it behaved like a mostly U.S. small and mid-cap growth fund. Uh, Over that period, the fund trailed IJT and IWP. Those are U.S. small and mid-growth ETFs. Uh, The fund returned 7.11% compound over the period versus 7.43% and 7.57% respectively for the ETFs. And the market, the market for, for fund flows did not like that very much. She grabbed some inflows in 2003 when she had started managing the fund. Uh, But every other year saw big outflows, like large percentages of the the total assets of the fund. Uh, She also managed the Alliance Bernstein Sustainable Global Thematic Fund from November 2008 to late May 2013. And again, using return attribution. Wow, because that's a rough period or what? No, wow, because she started it or started managing it right at the oh, yeah. tail yeah, yeah. end of the crisis. So this one behaved like a U.S. large and mid-cap uh, growth and emerging markets fund, uh, again, based on return attribution. I didn't have the easy ability to go back and look at like the actual geographic allocation, so that's just a returns-based attribution. Uh, the fund returned 10.5% per year on average. Uh, IWP returned 19.43%. VMAX, that's the Vanguard Emerging Markets Fund, returned 15.33%. And IVW, that's iShares Large Growth, returned 15.73%. And so again, the, the market wasn't really into that. Uh, and the fund saw big outflows every year that Kathy managed it. And then the last one that I was able to get data on, and there are a few others that were listed in other countries, and it just wasn't as easy to get the same kind of information on those ones. Um, so she managed the Alliance Bernstein U.S. Strategic Research Fund from the end of 2009 to June 2013. And I couldn't find details, but it, it might have been an incubation fund because it was never very big. Like it had small infos in the, in the single digit millions uh, in most years. And then the fund closed down completely in 2013, liquidated hmm. in, uh, in 2013. That fund returned 9.47% from inception into liquidation. And... I didn't have returns attribution for that one because it was closed, so I didn't have the same access to uh, to data. But over that period, small growth returned seventeen point four one percent, large growth thirteen, and mid growth fifteen point one two. So if it was any of those, which I imagine it probably was, based on Kathy's general strategy, it was a pretty significant uh, under underperformer. And again, it's not a knock on, knock on Kathy. That's that's not the uh, that's not the intention, um, but it's just interesting to see that she's been th- been in a similar situation where um, she's had negative returns or, or benchmark trailing returns, followed by negative uh, negative flows. But nothing compared to the scale of the ARC funds. Nothing at that scale, and and it's you know different this time because Kathy owns the company now, right? She she bought it out or whatever happened uh, last year. And uh, it's it's possible that in in the past situations, I mean, what happens to a fund manager who's managing a fund with big outflows? They probably get reassigned uh, to a different fund, and br- they bring a new manager in to, to freshen things up. So maybe that happened, and and maybe now it's different because Kathy can actually stick with the strategy that she wants to, to execute on. Mm-hmm. So all, all that remains to be seen, of course. Um, now now the article that was posted on the ARC ARC site that we're talking about here. It is suggesting that innovation stocks are in deep value territory. 
uh, because of the recent decline in their prices, and that other companies in, in the benchmarks, the non-innovation companies, are at risk of, of being uh, disrupted, and that based on that disruption risk, their current valuations are far too high. And that's been the ARC narrative forever. Yep. Um, so they say that based on their forecasts for innovation platforms, their strategies today could deliver a 30 to 40%, and this is the headline grabber, a 30 to 40% compound annual rate of return during the next five years. That's a forecast if I've ever seen one. Yeah. <laughs> now, I wondered what is their definition of deep value? And it, I know it's different from ours because they're saying deep value relative to their projections, which are their models. Exactly. Um, and we're saying that the market uh, has the right information. They're basically saying the market doesn't have the right information. I think they were saying it's the deepest value they've seen by their metrics since 2018, I believe. Which is an interesting comment because it depends on their cash flow expectations. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> change, a, change a decimal point or uh, change things. DCF models are crazy. I remember when I was when I was doing my MBA, I was on the student investment fund that we had to do DCF models to value companies and decide whether the fund should allocate to them. Uh, it was it was striking to me that literally changing a basis point. Well, of course, I mean, of course, this makes sense when you think about it. Yeah. But when I was sitting down doing the modeling, it was just striking to me. You change a basis point in your discount rate, for example, and a stock goes from a from a buy to a sell, or you change a a basis point in your growth expectations. Same, same thing. So it's just, it's funny to hear it from ARC who's relying on their models. Uh, okay, so what does deep value look like? Uh, ARK, A-R-K-K, -A their, their flagship innovation fund, has a price to book of 5.19. I know a lot of people don't like price to book, so it's got a price to sales of 11.48 and a price to earnings of 41.51 as of December. Now, I compared that to the iShares mid-cap value ETF, and I chose mid-cap because it had the closest market cap, average market cap, to the innovation fund. Uh, it's got a price book of 2.45, price sales of 1.69, and price earnings of 11.73. So for the iShares mid-cap value ETF, its valuation wow. is 47% the valuation of ARC by price to book, 15% by price to sales, and 43% Wow. By price to uh, earnings. So, I mean, wow. it, it, it takes some gymnastics to make ARC look deep value. Um, and the iShares mid-cap value is not even supposed to be like deep, deep value. It's just value. <laughs> so, I, I, as expected, a uh, little, little different uh, definition of what constitutes deep value, but interesting nonetheless. Now, reading through the letter, the part that I found, I think, most interesting, um, and I'll, I'll try and I'll do my best to explain to explain why. Uh, so they, they start projecting the size of the innovation platforms relative to global market cap. Based on their research, the opportunities will scale from 10 to 12 trillion, or roughly 10% of global market cap today, to 200 trillion plus in the next 10 years. Okay. Now remember, they said that they've got a thirty to forty percent five-year compound return projection. Um, I saw the ten to twelve trillion to two hundred trillion growth in the next ten years, and I just wondered what what is the compound return to to get there? Well, it's thirty nine point five percent. Like, huh? That's interesting. <laughs> I'm, so then I start wondering, like, is is the ten to two hundred trillion growth projection is that supporting the thirty to forty percent five-year compound return? projection and I don't know it's not it's not explicit that it is supporting it but it it's it's certainly implied and the problem with that if that is what they're saying is that we know from financial economics research that growth in market cap is not the same thing as growth in returns for investors unless there's no no new entrance in the marketplace in, unless there's no new share issuance or new companies uh, issuing stock exactly so it's Another way to say that is that it's growth in earnings per share that results yep. in growth in returns, not growth in market cap. Market cap right. can grow while earnings per share decreases. Yep. If a whole bunch of new competition uh, raises raises capital, or stay the same at least, maybe maybe not necessarily decrease. 
Uh, now, in a faster growing sector or country, which is what ARC is explicitly investing in, that gap between capitalization growth and returns is going to be larger than uh, than a more stable a more stable uh, sector because of the new equity issuance and existing companies raising capital to fund their growth. So those are both activities that grow the size of the market, but they don't increase the earnings per share. And uh, who knows, you could even see uh, earnings per share decrease. Um, so I, I, it's not obvious to me that saying, well, this sector is going to blow up and therefore returns are going to follow. It's that's and not how it works. Isn't that also what you would expect from innovation? The new equity issuance and all that stuff? Yeah, like new innovators coming to market to innovate. Yeah, yeah, Well, So this is one of the problems, one of the many problems with investing in technological revolutions is all the new equity issuance dilutes uh, earnings per share. Plus all the other stuff. Like what, what? what's the other problem? Well, one of the other problems is that investors will often overpay for, for growth. Uh, which results in lower realized returns, even if the market capitalization does increase a lot. Uh, and that's not even to mention the the Lubosch Pastor uh, Jensen's inequality idea, um, where uncertainty about future profitability causes prices to be high, all else equal. Um, that's the, the the rational story for high prices and technological yep. revolutions. But uh, take all that together, and, and the the thing that it, it just struck me is, huh. Interesting. They're saying that the sector is going to grow by by 40%, 39.5% over 10 years. And they're saying that their returns are going to be 30 to 40%. Um, yep. I don't know. I don't know. Didn't, didn't quite, quite add up. Uh, and near the, did the, uh, the, the deep value uh, comment. So Kathy, or I don't know if Kathy wrote the whole thing, the whole post. She definitely wrote the introduction. But at the end of the post, it says, in our view, these Pavlovian responses, responses to flee from their types of strategies, will prove just as wrong as those in the early days of the coronavirus crisis. They are backward looking and do not recognize that companies investing aggressively today are sacrificing short-term profitability for an important reason, to capitalize on an innovation age the likes of which the world has never witnessed. We will not let benchmarks and tracking errors hold our strategies hostage to the existing world order. What a statement. Um, and, we, and we all know what you're thinking. <laughs> well, so my take on that was, okay, so... Oh, we know your take. <laughs> basically, small growth, low profitability, uh, which we know is the worst performing segment of stocks. Small growth, low profitability is different this time, is basically what, what they're saying. And economic growth is the same thing as investment returns, yep. which uh, those are those are a couple of pretty big leaps of faith, at least relative to history. But um, history is backward looking, so uh, maybe we should ignore it. Well, I'm sure Mike and his coworkers in the states recently listened to that episode or the couple episodes on technological revolutions and know exactly what you were thinking. <laughs> yep. That's fascinating. So the big topic for today, this is something you've been thinking about for a while. Yeah. So where this came from, you always ask me where I, where I got the idea or whatever from. I, I was listening to, um, I mean, my efforts to learn more about Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrency and all that stuff. I was, I was listening to a podcast where somebody who believes markets are efficient was, and it's, 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 it was not a good, not a good podcast. Um, like I wouldn't really recommend it to anybody, but it was, <laughs> I was trying, I'm trying to understand like the culture of like, what are the, what are the people that, that believe, um, really strongly in Bitcoin? What are they, what are their beliefs? What do they think? And this, this podcast was great for that. Um, but for other things I wouldn't, I wouldn't really recommend it anyway. Uh, so they had somebody who believes markets are efficient on the podcast and they were all debating with that person why markets are inefficient and, and how they've, they've made, uh, so much money in Bitcoin by being smarter than the market. And uh, it, the, the, the efficient market side of the debate was, was I think, well represented. It was, it was, it was pretty good. Um, and, and the inefficient market, inefficient market side was, I mean, I, I'd call it egregious, but that's just my, my opinion, I guess. Um, but th there were so many common 
misconceptions in that podcast that it just, it, it jumped out at me as an opportunity to, to not respond to that podcast that I listened to. Um, cause I added a bunch more stuff and took some stuff out, but just to do an episode on market efficiency, myths and misconceptions. Cause I think there are a lot of people out there that just dismiss market efficiency as, as, as an incorrect model without understanding what the implications of market efficiency are or how you test it. Um, so the, the, the first one is the market perfectly efficient. It's not. <laughs> and if you go back to Fama, so Fama 1970 says that a market in which prices always fully reflect available information is called efficient. That's the Fama's original definition of market efficiency. But he also says, though we shall argue that the model stands up rather well to the data, it is obviously an extreme null hypothesis. And like any other stream null hy extreme null hypothesis, we do not expect it to be literally true. So there it is from, from Fama himself. We don't even, ex we don't expect the market to be efficient. It's just a, it's just a model. It's just a model. And, and one of the ways that they broke that down is that they, they Fama categorizes uh, tests for efficient markets into the weak, semi-strong and strong form. Uh, and that you can test each of those forms of market efficiency to kind of see where, where, uh, on that spectrum are real markets. So weak form market efficiency means, uh, information in historical prices is, is in prices. So in other words, technical analysis of past data does not result in trading profits. Semi-strong form means public information is in prices. So public information can't be used to earn profits if the market is semi-strong form efficient. Strong form means no investors have higher expected trading, trading profits because they have monopolistic access to some information. If the market's not strong form efficient, it means that some investors do have monopolies over some types of information, which they can use to earn trading profits. Right. Uh, so Fama finds that there's no, back then in 1970, that there's no important evidence against the hypothesis in, in the weak and semi-strong form tests and only limited evidence against the hypothesis in the strong form tests. Uh, now, an interesting point that came up for me while I was working on this, we have Eric Budish from the University of Chicago coming up uh, later this year as a guest. And he's done a, a bunch of work on high frequency trading and market structure. And he actually argues that the market is objectively, testably inefficient at the millisecond horizon uh, by design of the market. So Eric Budish specializes in market design, which is a just a fascinating uh, concept to think about. And uh, his, his argument is that the market by design is inefficient at the millisecond horizon, which is why HF, HFTs, high frequency trading firms, uh, make their money. And it's like a, a constant tax on, on market Fascinating. function. And his whole thing, I mean, we'll have him on as a guest later to hear about his work, but his whole thing is that this could be solved with market design um, by, moving from, uh, by, by moving to discrete time trading with batch aux auctions. Uh, anyway, that's so. Way if it's that moment that. between information becoming public and the market reflecting that information, that millisecond between those two points in time, is that what he's referring to? Uh, the continuous time trading structure of. I'd have to go back through his. I'd have to go back through his paper. It's not a. But, but the millisecond millisecond that is inefficient is that moment in time. I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, and you can solve that with discrete time trading with batch auctions that would be ran people could randomly bid on the batch auctions anyway, it, would, it would take away the the inefficiency anyway way beyond the scope of this but i thought it was worth yeah. pointing out just because it's it's super interesting. cool that's very cool uh okay so what does the emh actually say what does the efficient market hypothesis actually say people often say markets aren't efficient okay what what is what does it actually say <laughs> what does it mean to say markets are efficient before we before we dismiss it uh, so one of Fama's big insights is that it, markets are information markets. Markets are informationally efficient if prices reflect all currently available information about expected cash flows and risk. Efficiency comes from competition, low barriers to entry, and inf low information costs. If there's new information about future values that is not yet in prices, competitive traders will act on it, injecting their information into prices until the price uh, fully reflects available information. Uh, EMH also says that on average, competition will cause the full effects of new information on intrinsic value to be reflected instantaneously. 
and that's in quotation marks, instantaneously in quotation marks, in actual prices. I'll explain the, uh, I'll explain the quote, quotation marks. Uh, so due to vagueness and uncertainty in new information, actual prices will initially over-adjust to changes in intrinsic values as often as they will under-adjust, and the lag in the complete adjustment of actual prices to new intrinsic values will also be an independent random variable, with the adjustment of actual prices some, sometimes preceding the occurrence of the event. For example, the event is anticipated by the market before it actually occurs, and sometimes following. We'll, we'll dig more into that uh, a little bit later, but that came from uh, Fama's you know, 1965 paper on random, random walk theory. Um, so that, that instantaneous reflection of information in prices it does not mean prices are always right. It means prices can be wrong, but the, uh, the extent to which prices are wrong is itself a random walk around actual prices. Hmm. So prices aren't necessarily always right, but they're wrong randomly, not consistently. Uh, okay. So what, one of the... One, one of the problems that I see with a lot of the criticisms of efficient market hypothesis is that they're anecdotal, like, you know, what, what about GameStop? Um, or they're just not testable. Uh, so there are lots of ways to test market efficiency, and I, I thought it'd be useful to talk about some of those. And now, now, it is important to point out that any test of market efficiency is jointly a test of the, of the efficient market hypothesis and of the model used for asset pricing in the test. So if we're, if we're running a test of efficient markets using the Fama French five-factor model as the asset pricing model for which the efficient market is pricing assets, a failed test, so if we find that markets are inefficient, uh, that could mean that the market is inefficient or that the model is wrong. Uh, now, random walks, are, do, do stocks actually follow a random walk like we would expect them to in an efficient market? What, what we can maybe in the notes for the show in the community and on YouTube and stuff, we can link these papers, but there are tons of papers going back to 1900 with Bekelier. Um, but it's stocks mostly follow a random walk, especially in the, in the short run there, there are stuff like momentum and reversals over longer periods of time. Um, but in the, in the short run, except the very short run at the millisecond horizon. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, EMH implies that simple trading rules or technical analysis, this is weak form, should not result in excess returns beyond what would be expected by luck. And so for papers on that, Fama 1965, Fama and Bloom 1966, they found that to be that, that testable hypothesis to be true. Uh, EMH implies that fundamental analysis of individual securities done by skilled managers should not result in excess risk-adjusted returns beyond what would, what would be expected by luck. Lots of literature on that. Um, but Carhartt 97, Fama and French 2010 are two of the, two of the big ones. I think Burke and Green's theory paper on that one is really good too. That's the one that talks about, um, even if there is manager skill, it diminishes, uh, it, it, the ability to express the, the manager skill diminishes with increasing assets in a fund. So if there is a skilled manager, I'd, investors will identify them and shovel assets in there until there's no more alpha and the investor just are, are just returning earning returns commensurate with the risk that they're taking. Lot, lots of literature on that, though. Uh, EMH implies that market prices should respond quickly to new information. And again, uh, Fama Fisher, Jensen, and Roll had a big paper in 1969 on that, and there are, there's, there's a lot more. Uh, I just grabbed the Fama papers. Uh, it implies that the expected returns from any investment will be consistent with the risk of the investment. So, of course, Fama French 93 in 2015 uh, found that to be to be true, and then from that we know that there are differences in in expected returns, which, uh, as many of our listeners know, investors can use to their advantage. So th there's a bunch of tests for uh, EMH. Do do stocks follow a random walk? Um, does technical analysis work? Uh, does security analysis work? Uh, do, do prices respond quickly to new information? Those are called event study tests. Um, and our, our returns related to risk, of course, inconclusive because the joint hypothesis problem, but it's plausible at least. Uh, so those are those are some testable hypotheses. Now, the other question is what what does this EMH not say? <laughs> I 
I think there are lots of misconceptions there too. Uh, it does not say that prices are right at all times. I think that's a big common misconception. For sure. Uh, even, yeah. It, 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 so it, what it implies is that errors in market prices are unbiased. Uh, prices can be greater or less than true value at any point in time as long as the deviations are not predictable. That to me is the key. Yeah. So Errors in market prices are unbiased. Yeah. It's a very powerful statement. Oh, yeah. Even if you can identify inefficiencies at a point in time, it, it doesn't mean that you're going to be able to. And it's just a model. Yeah. It's not reality. It's just a model. <laughs> it's a pretty good model, though. Uh, now, of course, the, the randomness, uh, the, the random walk around actual values in an efficient market uh, means that there's an equal chance that a stock is under or overvalued at any point in time. Uh, if those deviations from market price uh, are, are random, you would not expect any group of investors to be able to consistently find consistently find mispriced securities and earn excess returns. And I, there, there was the empirical work that we mentioned a minute ago, finding that that's generally true. Um, efficient markets does not say that no investor will beat the market. It doesn't say that at all. If it's random, it says roughly half of all investors will beat the market before costs and, and less than half after cost. That's the arithmetic of, of active management. And dollar weighted, I mean, even less after the, the skewness in, in stock returns. Um, but it doesn't mean you won't have stocks that have unbelievable returns. Yeah, well, that's the skewness like for Apple sure. Apple or Amazon, like the skewness will exist. The, the, the Hendrik Bessenbender papers were... And there was an ar- a write-up about this on uh, Financial Times that I saw when I was uh, researching our conversation for uh, with Robin Wigglesworth coming up next week. There, there was an article saying that Hendrik Bessenbender's work basically proves that people like Kathy Wood should happen sometimes. Yeah. It's a pretty, pretty interesting take. Um, Speaking of which, did you see the data on the amount of market cap that Apple has increased by since Tim Cook took over a decade ago? No. Increase in market cap seven hundred million dollars per day well, for a decade. Bad. Not too bad. Per day. Yeah, it's crazy. As it goes through three trillion dollars in total value. Anyways, a little that's sidebar. A lot, a lot of talking about skewness. Yeah, well, that's uh, Apple would be in there in those papers for the um, m- most contribution to wealth creation. Definitely. Uh, so, what what is the alternative model? to efficient markets. Um, I don't think there's a lot of disagreement on the empirical aspect of stock returns. You can't really disagree with that, Um, just observations. Uh, But there's a lot of disagreement on what's driving prices, risk or or behavior. So in the behavioral school of thought, asset prices are not based on rational assessments of expected returns, but on predictable behavioral biases. Now, to be fair to behavioral finance, it does have a deep and continually growing literature on how human behavior uh, errors can explain asset pricing anomalies. And like for every rational asset pricing anomaly, there's a behavioral explanation for it. At least it seems that way. Uh, So I think there is a strong case that EMH is not the only model for markets, but what does that mean practically? It's like, okay, behavioralists have won the debate. We agree asset pricing is irrational. What does that actually mean for people who are investing money. Um, so I thought we'd play a clip from our, our episode last year with Professor Hirsch Sheffrin. And he, he's one of the first, earliest, and most prominent voices in behavioral finance. Uh, so we, we, we heard from him on uh, what, what the behavioral finance evidence means for most investors. Like, should you behave differently if we agree that markets are not efficient? I'd like to go back to the theme of market efficiency and you talk about how markets can become or go out of kilter. So I'm wondering, based on that, should investors still own index funds, which makes so much sense in the framework of market efficiency? Yes. So, um, at, so at the end of Beyond Green Fear, I, I talk about you know the lessons, the takeaways, um, and the, the lessons for most investors not all investors, but for most investors, is from a financial wealth generation perspective, 
act as if mark invest as if markets are efficient, even though they're not. If you're a, if you're in it for the long term, you want to be careful not to outsmart yourself, because there are two counterbalancing forces at work because of behavioral issues. The first is markets are not fully efficient. And so there are theoretical profit opportunities. And the second is you can be the victim of your own behavioral biases. And if the biases are stronger than the potential for alpha, you will be sorry in the long run. Most people will be sorry. And that's why most investors earn less from a return perspective than the overall markets because their biases get in the way. So uh, it's not as if it's not as if there, there isn't theoretical alpha alpha out there waiting to be uh, exploited. Alpha exists as a potential, but you 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 have you have to be pretty close to neoclassical in your behavior to actually exploit it over the long run, and you have to be willing to take a risk. So there's a there's a message at the end of the book is to understand the following. Number one, most investors should invest as if the efficient market school prescription is right. Don't try and beat the market. Just put together a long-term sensible investing strategy and stick with it along the roller coaster. Second, what behavioral forces will do, especially heuristics, heuristic driven bias, is it will inject volatility into the market over and above fundamental volatility, the volatility created by fundamentals. So because of that, you have um, sentiment based risk, risk associated with changes in sentiment. Uh, sentiment being psychological uh, forces at work, the things that impact us because of uh, uh, um, heuristic driven bias in particular. But also framing effects, uh, um, which I can talk about uh, 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 later. But but because of that, um, it's 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 a, it's a wild it's a wild ride. And the best thing is for most investors, from a financial wealth perspective, is simply act as if it, it, it be willing to experience sentiment based risk. There's really not much you can do about it. It's simply the cost you bear for, for getting a decent return in the long run. Um, and uh, if you can accept it, then you can sort of have peace of mind uh, over the long term in terms of your. Wow. So I, I, I think that's pretty big to hear from one of the, you know, original guys uh, in behavioral finance. So he, he very explicitly believes, I mean, that's one of his big pillars of belief that markets are not efficient. And he spent his career testing that hypothesis, mm -hmm. the, the anti EMH hypothesis, but his conclusion is that investors should act as if the market is efficient <laughs> for most people um, b because our own human biases are gonna outweigh the alpha opportunities most of the time. Uh, I don't know. Uh, another way to think about that is that while there are investment strategies that, that could theoretically exploit the behavioral errors of other investors, uh, investor failures in applying those philosophies to earn alpha can be attributed to probably the same <laughs> set of behavioral errors that caused the anomalies to exist in the first place. <laughs> It's kind of a funny thing to think about, and therefore, it's kind of like the 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 random the random walk around actual prices. We know prices can be wrong, but it's going to be a random walk. We know there can be behavioral errors, but uh, whether you can actually exploit that or not is probably going to be a random walk too. So, therefore, behave as if markets are efficient. Um, I also wanted to note, I just as I was preparing this, I it made me think back to Wes Gray, which is a an older episode. But Wes decided to become a quant investor after kind of getting his butt kicked as a fundamental uh, stock picker. <laughs> and so again, I, I just thought it's, it's in, interesting to hear somebody who's gone through that transition of let's behave as if the markets are, are inefficient. And now Wes doesn't necessarily believe that the markets are 
are efficient now, but he sure invests in, in a way that could be justified on the basis of, of behavior yeah. or, or risk. So I, I thought we could hear from him quickly too. Can you talk a little bit more about the importance of biases when you made that switch from being a, a, a human stock picker, obviously with biases, to quant? How did you realize that you had to eliminate the biases? Again, this is a personal thing because there definitely are stock pickers, and I know a few who they're just machines or robots. And for whatever reason, they have way better capability to kind of harness and manage these problems. And I used to think I could do that too. But for me, it was just eating like tons of humble pie. So I, I kind of did, if you guys know like the Warren Buffett story, you know, there's stories about him like putting like 70% of his capital in Geico. And obviously that ended up being a good thing. And he's, you know, multi-bajillionaire. And I ended up doing a similar thing where I had this super concentrated portfolio of these like uber small, like net net liquidation deals. And on one of them in particular, which ended up being a fraud and like a total bust, I think I got it up to like 60% of the capital in there because I was just, I'd done so much work. And when you do so much analysis, what happens and now, now, of course, I read all the psych studies that say I was just succumbing to all the problems. But as you read more and more information, your confidence goes up, but a lot of times your forecasting ability of like predicting doesn't really move. Like, you know, you, for, you need the first few pieces of information to kind of get you in the right ballpark of reality. But then what happens as a stock picker like me is you get so obsessed and you read everything, you do all this work, you spend all this time and you just keep getting more and more confident in your decision and you end up doing stupid things like I did where I had like 60% of my portfolio in one penny stock and which after the fact obviously seems stupid, but I actually did that. And it was, I think it was just because, you know, I was fall, fall, falling prey to all the standard problems. And I just, it just, I realized through experience and after getting my ass handed to me that I just need rules, man, because there's no amount of, you know, convincing yourself when you're in the fight that you're not suffering from overconfidence. You're not, you know, believing your own story. So you just need rules. At least I did. So for me, that, that's very important, but you know, other people are different. Okay. So Kind of a, just a neat, neat story from from Wes, and kind of fun to resurface something from uh, from a while back in the podcast. Uh, but one of the other ones that comes up is what about like given anomaly? So seasonality is a big one, momentum is another big one, uh, and those you know it's hard to explain seasonality by risk. It's hard to explain momentum uh, using using risk. So if a market inefficiency can persist. Uh, or, or a market inefficiency can persist if it's too expensive to trade it away. Um, so for seasonality, uh, there, there's a good paper by Novi Marks and Velikov from 2015, and they find that the net alpha after transaction costs for trading on seasonality is negative in micro caps, small caps, and large caps, with micro caps being by far the most negative due to the highest transaction costs. So there's a limit to arbitrage where even if seasonality does exist and it is a market inefficiency, uh, you can't really exploit it. And that's why, that's why it still shows up in the data. But if you go and try and trade on it, uh, it'll go away or you, you won't capture it after, after costs. Now, momentum is harder to explain and Ken French will tell us the same thing in a second, uh, but it is resilient to transaction costs. Uh, it, it does take a hit, like transaction cost momentum are higher than, than other strategies. Uh, or some other strategies. Um, it doesn't disprove EM, EMH necessarily, keeping in mind EMH is just a, just a model, but it is a challenge to, to efficient markets for sure. Now, it's kind of a hard topic to talk through, and, and we asked Ken French about this back in episode 100, so I thought we could just hear from him instead of me trying to stumble through, hear from Ken French <laughs> on how, <laughs> how uh, momentum relates to market efficiency. We've talked quite a bit about the risk-based framework for asset pricing. One of the things that's been observed empirically pretty persistently is the momentum effect, which does not fit at all, I don't think. Well, anyway, into the risk-based framework for asset pricing, how do you think investors should approach momentum, which again is empirically robust? How should investors approach implementing that in their portfolios? 
Well, first, I'm with you. It's really hard for me to reconcile momentum with a risk-based story. So I never argue prices, you know, all prices are right. I think there probably are mistakes in prices. My trouble is I don't know which ones are too high and which ones are too low. So if I'm thinking about momentum, what I basically want to do is look at the last year. It's not quite the last year. If I look at last month, there are reversals. The companies that did really well last month tend to do poorly. And the companies that did really poorly last month tend to do well. Momentum's the reverse. Momentum says, okay, stocks that did really well last year, they tend to continue to do well for the next few months. Stocks that did poorly for the last year, they tend to continue to do poorly. And so you can see if I've got this reversal going on last month, I can strengthen the momentum effect just by holding last month out. So that's what we do. We look from minus two to minus 12, and that's where we see persistence. What dimensional does is say, look, we don't really understand what's driving momentum, but it's such a robust characteristic in the data. Let's not ignore it. On the other hand, we know it's a high turnover strategy. If I really wanted to pursue an active momentum strategy, you're going to be turning your portfolio over a lot. That's going to cause transactions costs. We're careful. We don't want to impose transaction costs on our clients. So what we say is, uh, let's not chase momentum, but let's use momentum if we were going to trade anyway. So what I mean by that is, suppose we have a stock we'd like to sell. It was a small stock portfolio. The stock is now big. It doesn't fit in the portfolio. We'd like to sell it. Before we sell it, we look to see what happened from month minus two to minus 12. If this stock was a great performer, which you might expect because it used to be small and it's not anymore, you'd say, well, this stock went up a lot from minus two to minus 12. Momentum predicts it's probably going to continue to do well for the next few months. We don't sell it. For individual investors, there's no reason they can't do the same thing if they are trying to manage their own portfolios in this fashion. So they are trying to pick winners. Okay, use momentum in that same fashion that says, okay, if you're going to trade anyway, then pay attention to what's happened in the prior year. If you were going to buy something and it's underperformed recently, you probably want to wait. If you were going to sell something and it's overperformed recently, you probably want to wait. Otherwise, do what you would have done anyway. Now, I'm not advocating anybody should be out there actually doing this sort of trading, but if you're going to, that's how you might want to take advantage of momentum. Okay, so seasonality is strongest in microcaps and doesn't hold up to transaction costs, which is why we still see the data. Um, momentum is there in the data even after transaction costs, but it's a high turnover strategy to pursue on its own. And so many investors, including clients of Dimensional uh, like us, may not want to pursue momentum directly. And, and interestingly, if momentum does persist, the fact that Dimensional is not trying to chase momentum is potentially a reason why it would persist. There is a bit of a limit to arbitrage mm. or a limit of our arbitrage argument in there. If a huge asset manager like Dimensional decides we're going full in on momentum and building a momentum strategy, that could make momentum go away. Hmm. But because Dimensional is not sure if it's going to persist or not, the fact that they won't pursue it means that it might persist. <laughs> <laughs> hadn't thought of that. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, so those are both limit to arbitrage uh, arguments. There's a, a, an on-paper arbitrage opportunity, but not everyone's willing or able to exploit it, so it persists in the, in the data. But as uh, Hirsch Sheffrin told us, an arbitrage based on investor behavior is never really an arbitrage because uh, an arbitrage would be a risk-free profit because when behavior is involved, there's also sentiment risk, which can move move against you. So nothing's, nothing's free. And I don't think that uh, dis disproves efficient markets. Pricing anomalies don't disprove efficient markets. Keeping in mind, it's just a model. Uh, some of the other big ones that come up are, well, what about, you know, <laughs> Warren, Warren Buffett? How and, many what abouts you heard like this? Well, this whole episode's what abouts, isn't it? Uh, what, what about Buffett? And what about Renaissance technologies? Um, so I wanted to give some commentary on that. I actually think Renaissance Technologies is proof that markets are 
mostly efficient. And I'll explain why. Um, their main fund with the ridiculous performance uh, that was documented by Greg, uh, Greg Zuckerman. Zucker. And we, Zuckerman. We had him on our, yeah. had him on our podcast talking about that. Uh, so that, that ridiculous performance record, that, that fund has been closed to outside investors since 2003 and is capped at $10 billion and all of the profits are distributed each year. Yep. If markets were mostly inefficient rather than mostly efficient, Renaissance Technologies would not have to cap their fund size and distribute all the profits and close the fund to new investors. Um, if they let their fund compound, they would run into the problem that all, all big active managers have, which is dealing with, with scale. Skill in fund management does not scale in a way that benefits investors. It scales in a way that benefits fund managers. Um, so there's, there's an efficient market for manager skill. Um, but if, if the markets were infinitely inefficient, then scale wouldn't, wouldn't be a problem. And, and that's uh, the point that, uh, that Cliff made when he was on. So if you can get into rent tech, go ahead, get in. You can't get in. Yeah, yeah. he says the the difference between us and rent tech is that we'll take your money or something like that. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and so that that's empirically well known that uh, scale reduces alpha that funds are able to generate. Uh, so if there is someone that has some ability to exploit market inefficiencies, that their ability to do that is limited because uh, markets are are largely efficient, even if not perfectly, which was never the hypothesis anyway, right? It's, it's the hypothesis. It was never the expectation anyway, that markets would be uh, perfectly, perfectly efficient. So that's Renaissance Technologies. I think it's actually evidence that markets are mostly efficient as opposed to the other way around. Uh, and what about Buffett? So there's of course the 2018 paper, Buffett's Alpha, and the authors of that paper find that accounting for exposure to market beta, size, value, momentum, Betting against beta quality and leverage, which Buffett obtained implicitly through the float in his insurance business, uh, those factors explain most of Buffett's past performance, and they actually uh, make his uh, his alpha, his excess risk adjusted performance, statistically insignificant when you account for the factors that he was hmm. uh, he was exposed to. Um, so, Buffett's success has. In this, in that model, they found that Buffett's success was not due to his superior stock picking abilities, but he was implementing a systematic investment strategy that could have been reasonably implemented by somebody else in an efficient market. I guess momentum being the exception there, because that one's uh, that one's not that doesn't doesn't fit into the mold of efficient markets. But uh, Buff Buffett's stuff could have been recreated systematically. Uh, and then I also thought it was interesting. Uh, I don't know if this proves or disproves anything about efficient markets. I just thought it was interesting on on Buffett. Going back to 2002 through the end of 2021, Berkshire Hathaway has trailed the U.S. market by an annualized 80 basis points. That's a long time. And you time. might say, well, that's because value's done terribly, which is true. Uh, but Berkshire has only beaten the DFA U's, uh, U.S. large value three portfolio, which is a systematic value fund, by an annualized two basis points over the same period. So... I mean, that's, that's anecdotal, but it, it would appear as if Buffett's investors are earning returns commensurate with the risk they're, they're taking, which is what yeah. you would expect because of the scale problems that, uh, that Berkshire Hathaway's had just as, as the fund is, or the company, I guess, has, uh, has grown. Okay. Good, good for one more section. Sure. Okay. Th this one, uh, this one was fun to learn about. Um, I spent the better part of a day reading papers uh, on do, do, do people with special knowledge earn excess returns? That's a pretty interesting question. And again, this came from that the, the Bitcoin podcast that inspired me to to do this <laughs> topic. Um, all, all these guys were talking about, well, we we understood the technology better than everybody else, and that's why we were able to earn excess returns and their efficient market counterpart in that discussion was saying, no, you just got lucky. <laughs> so I, 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 it's interesting though, like do people with specialized knowledge earn excess returns? So let's, uh, let's, let's talk about it in an efficient market. Of course, um, a experts in general are pretty bad at making predictions. Uh, they're pretty good at assessing base rates, but that's very different from making a 
a prediction. Like a, a base rate is 90% of active fund managers um, underperform the index over 10 years. That's a base rate. A prediction is uh, ARC is going to outperform over the next five years. <laughs> ARC is going to earn 30 to 40% returns over the next five years. So experts are really bad at making those types of predictions, uh, better at assessing base rates. Uh, I think using specialized knowledge to earn returns in excess of risk taking is inherently a game of predictions because you're inherently projecting uh, cash flows. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's an NPR episode, uh, their Planet Money Summer School One, and this is this is just kind of a fun one, but it's it's worth mentioning. Um, uh, Planet Money Summer School One, the stock market. Uh, they give the Francis Galton at a county fair example that people have mm-hmm. probably heard about where he discovers the wisdom of crowds and their ability to guess on average the correct weight for a bull that nobody knew the actual weight of. So NPR recreated this experiment at some kind of fair or something. And they found the same result where the average guess was within 5% of the bull's actual weight. They also separated guesses made by experts and non-experts. So they had 3,000 people who had identified themselves as, as experts having worked with cattle. And they talk about in the episode how they actually followed up with those people, or at least with a cross-section of those people, to determine whether they were actually experts and where their expertise came from. Uh, and they said that everyone they talked to had like the real experience working with cattle. So they, they were, they could <laughs> genuinely be considered experts. They had We just can see where this is going, but okay. <laughs> uh, so the average guess of the experts was further from the actual weight than the average guess of the non-experts. It's crazy, right? Um, there's a 2004 paper. Uh, was there a NASDAQ bubble in the late 1990s? Luwash Pastor and Pietro Veronese. We've talked about this paper before. Uh, they show mathematically the higher uncertainty about the average profitability of the companies creating new technologies leads to higher prices, all else equal. So when an exciting new technology uh, company is being tested, there's a huge range of potential outcomes. Maybe it's the next uh, Microsoft, but, but maybe not. Yep. Um, and there's the special case in mathematics. I, I made a uh, note about it earlier uh, for convex functions called Jensen's inequality. Uh, so for the Gordon growth model for stock valuation, it implies that when dividend growth rates are modeled as uncertain, the expected growth rate required to explain a given price drops. Uh, the larger uncertainty about the dividend growth rate, the larger the drop in the expected growth rate required to justify a given price. Uh, so the important takeaway for for bringing that one up in this section is that uncertainty itself can result in higher prices. But when prices are high due to uncertainty, there's uh, an, an increased risk in betting on a certain outcome. Like saying with your expert knowledge, you know this thing is going to happen. Well, if there's a lot of uncertainty about that from other investors, even if you have specialized knowledge, you'll be paying prices that make it pretty risky to be sure about yourself. Um, okay, now this one was new for me. Those first two I'd heard before, um, but I found another one uh, that that's really, really interesting. Uh, so thinking about overconfidence, and this, this first one I'm going to mention is not the one I was excited about, but this one was good too. Uh, overconfidence. So 2010 paper from Cam Harvey, John Graham, and Itzhak Ben David. They looked at 13,300 expected stock market return probability distributions from CFOs. So they get CFOs to say, uh, give us your 80% confidence interval for future market returns. Um, but, but when they go and test those, uh, those expectations, only 36% of the realized market returns fell within the confidence interval of the, of the CFOs, or I guess the average confidence, confidence interval of the CFOs. Um, CFOs reduce the lower bound of their forecast forecast confidence uh, interval when times of high when there are times of high market uncertainty but their ex post miscalibrations are worse during periods of high uncertainty so they, they lower the they lower the lower bound but they actually do worse overall in terms of how poorly they predict crazy uh, the market yep so it's evidence of overconfidence because they're saying I'm 80% sure this is going to happen <laughs> <laughs> and it, uh, it it doesn't uh, and then of course uh, it, it, it's it's well documented in other fields uh, as as well that people overestimate the precision of their knowledge in in some circumstances, and that's especially true for challenging judgment tasks. Um, even experts are not great at making predictions, like I mentioned earlier. 
so this is the part that I was excited about when I when I found it and read through it. Um, there's there's theory and evidence suggesting that bubbles associated with new technology are related to overconfidence of some investors who think that they have special knowledge. So I found this paper specifically about this topic. It's by uh, Jose Shankman and Wei Jiang. So it's, it's a widely cited 2003 paper. I'm actually surprised that I hadn't come across it until now called Overconfidence and Speculative Bubbles. And he's, Jose uh, Shankman's done a bunch of talks on the paper as well that, uh, that I listened to. So they've got a model where speculators' overconfidence is a source of heterogeneous beliefs and arbitrage is limited. Uh, the model is able to reproduce the observed correlation between trading activity and asset prices that we've seen in historical bubbles. Optimistic beliefs may be the result of simple extrapolative schemes, imitation, or randomness, but also result from the actions of interested experts that wish to signal their familiarity with new technologies and have a tendency to exaggerate their value, general, uh, generating over-optimism among naive investors. So those are the suggestions of the, the sources of these heterogeneous wow. beliefs. Uh, so I got a quick quote from, from the lecture that I listened to uh, from Professor Shankman. Fluctuating heterogeneous beliefs among investors and the existence of an asymmetry between the cost of acquiring an asset and the cost of shorting the, that same asset. Uh, heterogeneous beliefs make possible the coexistence of optimists and pessimists in a market. The cost, and this is the important part, the cost asymmetry between going long and going short on an asset implies that optimists' views are expressed more fully than pessimists' views in the market. And thus, even when opinions are on average unbiased, prices are biased upwards. Wow. Isn't that cool? No kidding. So because there's a cost to shorting, more optimistic beliefs will be more pronounced in prices yeah. than more pessimistic beliefs. Wow. Yeah, yeah super cool. Um, finally, fluctuating beliefs give even the most optimistic the hope that in the future, an even more optimistic buyer may appear. Thus, a buyer would be willing to pay more than the dis discounted value she attributes to an asset's future payoffs because the ownership of the asset gives her the option to resell the asset to a future optimist. Basically, greater greater fool, uh, greater fool concept there. Basically, when short selling is expensive, the most optimi optimistic market participants price the market or have more influence over the price of the market, which can result in a bubble when overconfident investors are willing to pay prices that exceed their own valuation of future dividends because they believe that in the future they'll find a buyer willing to pay even more. Um, now it's that, that's it the a power of game storytelling. <laughs> yeah, um, or wherever the confidence comes from. I, I, I just that I, interesting I, dynamic. I love that their whole model, uh, and it's it's Shankman stuff is pretty heavy on the mathematics. Like he's he's actually done papers in in mathematics too. Um, so it's not not a light read, but uh, yeah, that that was the main concept that that over overconfident investors have more influence on prices. And when there's a new technology, um, those overconfident in, in his model, uh, which, which maps pretty well to realized experience and helps to explain the uh, high turnover around bubbles, which some other models have had difficulty explaining why that, why that happens. And his model does explain that, but it, it's rooted in overconfidence, uh, hmm. which, which I just find fascinating. Like this, it fits so well with the other stuff we've done on technological revolutions. I just, I hadn't, uh. I hadn't come across this one uh, yet. So uh, d d disagreement is not necessarily a source of predictable market inefficiency because we can't identify false positives ex ante. Uh, so as Fama says, it's uh, it's only a bubble in hindsight, which ties into the stuff we talked about on real estate too, I guess. Um, yeah, so that's uh, that's it. Even in... Uh, in an efficient market, there can be there can be overconfident people who think that they have better information than the market, and they can create price bubbles. Um, but uh, it, it's not necessarily proof the markets are inefficient. It's just evidence of disagreement. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I because this was inspired by Bitcoin, I just Google searched Jose Shankman Bitcoin. And he's, he participates in the uh, University of Chicago Initiative on Global Markets, which is like a survey that they do of a whole bunch of prominent economists on various questions. And he'd answered two questions on Bitcoin. And he made comments very similar to his past work on overconfidence and speculative bubbles, basically saying that uh, because, because it's hard to short, 
you would expect the more optimistic people to have much bigger influence on the price. And that's probably why we're seeing the prices that we're seeing. So it's just interesting to see it apply to, uh, to Bitcoin directly. Fascinating. All right. That's, uh, that's all I got. So you're good to move on to talking sense quickly. Yep. Let's go. So these are from the university of Chicago financial education initiative. Maybe this week we'll just do one. I actually have to go through and make sure we haven't done them before. So here it is. And I'll go first if you like. What is a responsibility that you are comfortable with? And what is one that makes you nervous? So I'm comfortable with um, the responsibility we have in terms of operating our company and our enterprise, which you know, we're now over 60 people on our team and it's a Certainly a growing enterprise. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. One that makes me nervous, and you, you you mentioned, I'm trying to think what makes me nervous in my life today that I'm responsible for. I, I kind of feel responsibility to understand more about crypto and Bitcoin and everything else. And that does make me nervous. Like It's just such a, a mind-bending world, and you've done a big dive over the past month or so into this. And it's just such a different framework it's kind of different everything. It's a whole new world. And I'm, it's not, I'm it's finding not, it's person. not, it's not, it's not. It's positioned to the whole new world. Maybe, okay, th- there you go. Maybe it is that, right? It still makes me nervous, right? Like this whole rebranding is Web 3.0. Yeah. yeah I just don't I, understand the technology well enough and the language is so different. Like I read Cam Harvey's book and it's just like, the, 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 the terms are different. The frame of reference of how I've been reading it is different. What it can do is just so mind exploding. Then you take with that this insatiable demand from, from the marketplace and so many people saying you got to do it if your advisor's not doing this you got to fire your advisor and, well that that comes from someone who left I think sold out a financial a traditional financial services practice and is now trying to make make it in in crypto that quote that you just said I saw that on Twitter too, <laughs> so a, a, a lot of the pro crypto stuff comes from uh, very very biased. Uh, very biased sources. Anyway, ho- hopefully we can uh, make you feel more comfortable with crypto in the next uh, next few months. Not that we're going to talk about it on on Rational Reminder because uh, no. we, we've gotten the feedback that people don't love that. <clears throat> so, what's the responsibility that you're comfortable with? Uh, it's a responsibility that, I'm, that I am comfortable with, L- like you said, I think that that managing the PWL enterprise and managing the assets on behalf of our clients, I'm, I'm comfortable with that uh we've we've like you said built up a a pretty substantial team and we've got in my opinion some of the best uh financial planners anywhere anywhere period unequivocally with 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 canadian specific knowledge sure but uh anywhere and so that that's definitely something that i'm comfortable with it doesn't all rely on uh me me or you no day to day um and I think we've got pretty good systems. So comfortable with that. Um, I'm comfortable with the responsibility of raising my kids. And that's one that, you know, it wasn't that long ago I didn't have kids. And uh, don't know how comfortable I felt with the idea of having kids at the time that we had our first one. <laughs> I remember my wife and I, we were in the hospital leaving uh, the elevator when they had discharged us. And we looked at each other like, are they are they really letting us leave with the baby? <laughs> But uh, but we all come, go through that, right? With yeah, 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 yeah. You kind of come home. It's like, okay, now what do you do? Yeah. Uh, one that I'm not comfortable with that makes me nervous is the house. Wow. I don't like having the house. <laughs> I, I like living here where we live. Um, but man, you know, I, I heard a joke or saw a joke on I don't know Reddit or maybe maybe Twitter about how people who own homes when they hear a noise. They hope it's a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> Not a raccoon in the attic. Because you don't have to fix something. Oh, yeah. There, yeah. Ho- homeownership is not a, it's not a walk in the park. Like it's, a, it's, a, it's a real thing. And that's, it's, yeah, it's something that uh, I got, I've got no choice at this point. I, I made the decision based on a 30-year time horizon, but it's, it's, it's definitely a source of, uh, oh, I don't know. It's funny it's you mentioned that. Like you may know my little atomic habit that that I've done, which is I have to do something every day, no matter how small it is yeah, in yeah. the house. 
it's every day you're going to be going, you have to be pushing that rock ahead. Because if you don't, you just get so behind so fast on anything, everything. Yep. So I, I, I look back to my days renting and, you know, it, it's not always good because landlords are, landlords differ. And sometimes it's very hard to get, um, you know, service or to get stuff fixed or whatever. Yep. But like the last house that we lived in, they were great. And it was like, hey, this thing broke. And it, it, in, in that case, the property manager uh, was a, a man and he had his his wife worked with him and his two or three brothers also worked with him. Um, and they did the labor. So it was like, you call him up and one of the three brothers is available anytime to come and fix whatever problem it is. Yeah. But now like to get labor as an owner, and I mean, maybe that's something you build up over time, like a network kind of thing. I'm, I'm not sure, but it's, uh, it's, it's not easy to call um, no. a tradesperson, and especially for small stuff. I, I, I don't know, I don't know. I'd prefer to spend time focusing on, you know, this, this stuff. Yeah. Um, yep. So there it is. Don't, I don't. House makes me nervous. All right. Anything else this week? No, I think that's good. Hopefully people uh, enjoy the episode. Excellent. And last week was Mac McQuown, and next week is the perfect bookend of that with Robin Wigglesworth. So, as always, thanks for listening. 